Okay, we are up to page Chafhe Amud Bet, 25b1, uh, if you're following along in the art scroll. And the Gemara says as follows. Ten Rabbanan. Ma'ase b'Rabbi Eliezer. There was a story with Rabbi Eliezer. Sounds like the Haggadah, okay? There's a story with Rabbi Eliezer. Shegazash lo shesei ta'aniyot alatzibur. He did 13 ta'aniyot on the, on the community. V'lo yaradu gishamim. That was three, seven, and three. Lo yadu gishamim, the rain did not come. Ba'acharonan, last one, hitchilu atzibu latzet. They finished the fast, they all started leaving. Amar lehem, he said to him, takantem kvarim latzmechem. Did you prepare graves? They finished the last fast, it didn't work. They have no rain, they're going to starve to death. Did you prepare graves, he asked them? Ga'u kol am Immediately, they all burst into uncontrollable crying. And the rain came because that managed to break their hearts and finally the stubbornness of their ways. In the end, again, one of the things we keep seeing here is this idea that, that the pain, the breaking point, the tears, the embarrassment, even after all the prayers are done, until that comes, uh, there stands a possibility of not being answered. But once that happens, Lev nishbav nitke Elohim lo the Gemara continues. Shuv ma'aseh b'Rabbi Eliezer. Another story with Rabbi Eliezer. She yarad l'fnei teva. He went down in front of the teva. Why does it say she yarad l'fnei teva? Because they used to put it down, further down. Okay. Ve'amar and he said esrim ve'arba berachot. Twenty-four berachot. What are these twenty-four berachot? We already learned in the Mishnah. We have the nineteen that we yeah. have, and then we add the ones, uh, the add the extra ones for the for the ta'anit. Ve'lo na'ana, lo ne'ana, and he was not answered. Yarad Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Akiva went after him. The Amar and he said, "Avinu Malkenu, en lanu melech elata. Avinu Malkenu lemaancha rachem alenu. Our father, our king, we have no king besides for you. Our father, our king, lemaancha rachem alenu. For your own, for your sake, have mercy on us. The Yardu Gishamim, and the rain began to fall. Havu Miranani Rabbanan. The people, the rabbis that were present, started making fun. They were being mizalzel in the kavod of Rabbi Eliezer. Why? Because they were saying that Rabbi Akiva, in two seconds he got his prayers answered. Rabbi Eliezer must not be on the same level as Rabbi Akiva. Yatzeta batko ve'amra. A batkol emanated, a heavenly voice emanated from the heavens and said, Lo gadol mizeh. Not because this one is bigger than this one. Ele shezeh ma'avir al midotav. Vezeh no ma'avir al midotav. The reason why this one was answered and this one was not answered is not because one was bigger than the other, but rather because one of them, i.e. Rabbi Akiva, is Ma'avir Midotav. He goes the extra mile to go above his, uh, his Midot. So in other words, an uh, example of Ma'avir Midotav is where somebody yells and screams at you and you don't respond back. So you, you're overcoming your Midot, okay? When a, a person overcomes their Midot, so Min Shamaim also, they, uh, they listen to him uh, before they listen to Rabbi Eliezer. The obvious question you have to ask is, No. The Gemara says, the Batko said, not because this one's bigger than this one. It's just that this person was Ma'avir al-Midotav, and the other one was not. I.e., he's bigger. So what does the Gemara mean? So I struggled to understand it. And I found two different Peshatim I wanted to share with you. There's one idea that's expressed in the Yifei Enayim. Yifei Enayim quotes the Gemara in the Talmud Yerushalmi. Let me read it to you. He says as follows. Yatzeta bat kol, bi Yerushalmi halacha dal Yerushalmi, it states, Rabbi Akiva be'atzmo amar lahem. It wasn't a bat call that rang out. It was Rabbi Akiva himself when he heard them saying, oh, look, Rabbi Akiva, I'm much bigger than Rabbi Eliezer. Rabbi Akiva himself said, no, it's not true. And he said to them, em lachem mashal dome. Let me give you an example to what this can be compared. The a king that had two daughters. One of them is kosher, it's good. The other one is chutzpah. She always... Uh, she, you know, she puts herself forward, she this, she that. Ema tahavya baya hi chatsufta. Whenever the one that had chutzpah would ask something for the king, 
Alat kumoi amar yibon le. The king would stand up and say, give it to her. Madihi baye. Let her have what she asks for. Vetezela. And let me get rid of her. The king, the daughter he didn't like, he answered first. Because he didn't want to deal with having this daughter on his case. The one that he loved, if she asked him for something, he didn't answer right away. Because he didn't mind having her around. In fact, we have this idea that um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves the tefillot of the Sadiqim. Exactly. And we answered because HaKadosh Baruch Hu loves their prayers. So Rabbi Akiva took what was an embarrassment to Rabbi Eliezer, flipped it on its head, and he said, you know why Hashem answered me before he answered him? He wanted to get rid of me. Him, he's a much bigger Sadiq. Hashem loves his tefillot. So I, I learned a couple things from this. The first thing I learned from this was Da'at Chachami, Da'at Torah, says the Gemara, Hefech Da'at Ba'alabayit. The understanding, the wisdom of the Torah, oftentimes, is the opposite of the way a regular person thinks. Regular person looks at this and says, oh, you see, he's a smaller tzaddik. Rabbi Akiva says, no, me, Paul. He's the opposite. He's the bigger tzaddik, and therefore Hashem wants to hear his prayers, and therefore he didn't answer him for longer. Um, that's one way of looking at it. Second way of looking at it is Rabbi Akiva was actually bigger than Rabbi Eliezer. But he was answering out of the kavod for his contemporary. He gave them a good answer to, uh, to sidestep the embarrassing story that happened to Rabbi Eliezer. Yeah? Let me give you another, exa- another answer from the Chachmat Manoach. The Chachmat Manoach, that, that was Yefei Naim, brings in the name of Yerushalmi. Okay? The, ch- the Chachmat Manoach, it's great when you ask a question and then you look in the Mifarshim and they all ask the same question. That's how you know you're on target. Says the Chachmat Manoach, I read in the Besef Bet Elokim, he asks, Im ken mitam shema avi al midotav, gadol mimenu, that makes him bigger. Vilama amar lo sheze gadol mize, not that this one is bigger than the other. Umetaretz, he brings, shekola mitzvot she asar Rabbi Akiva, asar Rabbi Eliezer kamo. They both did the same amount of mitzvot. They were both equal. Ela she Rabbi Eliezer haya beteva, Rebeliezer was a softer person. He was a nicer person. He was more inclined to do all the mitzvot. So when Rebeliezer did all the mitzvot, he did it, at a, it was easy. Rabbi Akiva was ma'avir al midotav, meaning that his midot were bad midot. Because we know that Rabbi Akiva did not grow up this way. So each mitzvah that Rabbi Akiva had to do, he had to go the extra mile. So the Gemara said, it's not that this one's bigger than this one. There was nothing more that Rabbi Eliezer could do. It's just that he was born with a more gentle, with a more genteel approach to life. A fascinating, beautiful answer from uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Beit Elohim brought down by the Chochmat Manoach. I saw another answer also that he says that Ma'avi Amidotav, so we have three different answers. The first answer is, what does it mean Ma'avi Amidotav? Rebbe, uh, um, what's it called? The, uh, the, the way the Yerushalmi would explain it, it's really, you're reading it the other way. This one is Ma'avi Amidotav, he's good. So Hashem didn't mind keeping him around. Keeping him around. So Ma'avi Amidotav is which side? The side that didn't get answered. That's a tremendous chidush, the Yerushalmi. Now we come to the second answer. The second answer is the Bet Elukim. He says, the Rabbi Eliezer, they both did the same. No, they could not have done more, either of them. It but it was hard of Rabbi Akiva. But that's not up to Rabbi Eliezer. So he's not bigger than Rabbi Eliezer. But Ma'avi Amidotav means he needed to work on his Midot. The last answer is Ma'avi Amidotav means he went above the measurement. What does that mean? The Rabbi Eliezer did everything that a person's supposed to do in Halakha. Everything a person's supposed to do according to the, to the law, according to the Hidur of the law. But Rabbi Akiva went further, what's it called, in his, in, his mitz, in his, what's it called, in how far he went. But it wasn't, it wasn't an addition in the mitzvah. So therefore, lo gadol mizeh. But he was ma'avir al midotav, he went the extra step. So min shamaim, they also went uh, the extra step. I, I, I had my own opinion as well over here, my own pshat as well. And that is that um, Rabbi Akiva, we know, came from a place where he said, show me a Talmud Chacham, and I'll bite him like a donkey. He was a person who was a wild man before 
he started learning Torah, okay? He had maybe perhaps negative traits. We know Rambam says that for a person to be able to overcome their negative traits, what do they have to do? How does a person, let's say a person is a, uh, a has kas. So usually you use, what do you usually do? You go in the middle of the road. But when a person, the only way he can overcorrect is what does he do? He goes all the way the other way. So that's what it means, Rabbi Akiva that was born with a negative starting point, the only way for him to wind up at the golden road in the middle was for him to be Ma'avir Amidotav, to go to the extra, to the furthest point, to end up in the middle. But that's not the ideal point. The Gemara is saying that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Eliezer really arrived in the middle in the same place. But Rabbi Akiva required more work to be able to get there. And therefore, the Minas Shamayim, they also rewarded him appropriately, but they ended up uh, in, the same, uh, in the same place. Let's move on. Okay, so three different opinions as to how these two things could coexist and still be, uh, could, uh, still be both true. Tan Rabbanan, Ad ma'atai yeyu ageshamim yordim v'atzibur poskim et ha'anitam. So what we're talking about over here is, remember we have a sequence of fasts. They fast three fasts. The fasts don't work. It's still a, uh, how do you call it? We're still having a, uh, a, a drought then they add on the next set, next set of fasts. If they, in the middle, saw that it stopped, it started to rain, then they, they don't have to fast anymore, okay? But we don't know, what does it mean that we left the drought? How much rain? How much rain do you need in order for that to be considered the case? Gemara says, Kimlo berech ha-macharesha. Divrei Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Meir says, you have to have water penetrating the earth to the length of the of the blade, of the, the hook, if you will, of the plowing, of the threshing of the plow. So when you stick the plow into the ground and you pull it through the ground, once you stick it and you look down to the depth of where it reaches, if you see water pooling straight to the bottom, so it's already penetrated down to that level of the earth, that, at that level of saturation we know that it's rained enough to say that the drought is over. If it's just raining, but it rained a little, and there's only a little bit of earth that's been saturated, then the drought is not yet done. The Chachamim Omrim, Chachamim explain, Becharava, in the dry earth, Tefach, you need saturation of a hand's breath. If you go to earth and it's Bebenonit, it's not wet, it's not dry, it's middle of the road earth. What's the Halacha then? Tefachaim, it needs to be two Tefachim into the earth. Abuda, what if the earth has already been plowed. At that stage, you need, says the Gemara, three tefachim. So an earth that's abuda, shalosh tefachim. Rashi explains that each one of these amounts is the same. It's just that it takes 10 inches of rainfall to penetrate dry earth, a tefach, because it's solidly dry. It needs to soak through. If you're talking about earth that's already uh, somewhat moist, so then it's much easier for the moisture to penetrate. So therefore, 10 inches in that kind of earth is, you know it's there if you have two tefachim. When it comes to earth which is already plowed, plowed earth is loose, so there's space between it. So the water penetrates much faster. So therefore, you only know that you've had the amount of 10 inches of rainfall, let's say, when you get three tefachim into karka, which is avuda, earth, which is, uh, which is plowed, and therefore that is the shiur. The Gemara says, Tanya, we learned in the Brayta, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar, Omer, Rabbi Shimon ben Elazar says, En chatefach min ma'ala, she'en tohom yotze likrato, shilosha tefachim. When the earth gets penetrated from above with one tefach of water, okay, from the heavens, from the waters from beneath rise towards it, three tefachim. We're not talking about, like if you see four tefachim, so one came from here and three came from there. We're talking about the waters at the utter depths of the Earth's core, which is a fascinating thing. I don't know if you saw the news. We were only talking about this yesterday or two days ago in the news, something like that, where they've discovered that the amount of water that exists under the Earth is incredible amounts of water. They also were checking out the, uh, um, the Earth on underneath the uh, Arctic Shelf, up until this point, they thought it was like mountains on dry land. But now they realize that it's more like mountains on a shelf as opposed to it. And they're realizing 
how much water exists underneath the core of the earth that they were not aware of uh, all, all this time. So Rabbi Shimon tells us, Rumel Azar, that whenever a tefach comes milmala, that in tehom yotzei lekrato shiloshat tefachim, it goes up at least three tefachim. The Atanya, but the Brisa, but the Brita says tefachim. The Brita says in another place um, it goes up two tefachim. So is it three or two? The Gemara answers lo kasha. It's not a question. Kan be'avuda, kan b'she'en avuda. The first case um, is a case where the the ground that it penetrated was ground that was avuda. So therefore, if it penetrated one tefach uh, in, in ground which was not avuda, that's much more rain. So therefore, it comes up three tefachim. When it said that it was two tefachim, it was ground which was not avuda. So therefore, it was ground, excuse me, that was avuda. So therefore, one tefach through ground that was already plowed is a much smaller amount of rain. So therefore, commensurate to that, it only comes up two tefachim. <clears throat> The Gemara continues. Amar Rabbi Elazar. Rabbi Elazar says, Kishim Naschim et Mechag, when they pour the water on the Mizbeach on Hagasukot, Tehom Omer Lechavero, the deep waters say, each one says uh, to their friends, they say, so to speak, one to the other, Shiloshat Tefachim. Sorry, Tehom. Uh, he tells one of the tehom, one depth, one body in the depths of water, says to the other one, that word aba, right? Um, we find it in a lot of different places. Abia, yom yom yabia omer. It means, uh, generally it means in a, a form of expression, okay? Now, what, what, are we, what are we communicating? What does one tehom say to the other? <clears throat> it's a, sorry? It's yeah, right? What, is the, what does one deep water uh, say to the other? Well, I'll, we'll come back to this in just one second uh, as to what this, what this conversation means. Um, Eba, express your waters, okay? Kol shnei ani shomea, because I can hear the voice of shnei of two friends, okay? What are the two friends? We already described this previously that there are two different types of nesachim that we pour on the Mizbeach. One is the wine and one is the water. If you remember, we made the pipes. The pipes are different thickness so that they come out at the same time. Shinei like it says, Tehom el tehom kore lekol tzinorecha. One tehom calls to the other tehom, lekol tzinorecha, to the sound tzinorecha means of your pipes. So the sound of the pipes, i.e., the, ra- the wine and the water pipes underneath the Mizbeach, um, causes tehom el tehom, uh, one tehom to call out to the other tehom. Um, and if you look at the end of the, the, that pasuk, kol mishbarecha vigalecha alay avaru, all of the breaking waves, they came over me. So one tehom says to the other tehom, we need to rise up now to sustain, to sustain the earth. Amar um, Rabbah says, now, oh, sorry, before we move on. The Gemara in other places asks this question. What does it mean that the deep waters, ch- you know, chat to the other deep waters? What are they using? You know, are they using WhatsApp? What's, what's going on here? Blue, t- blue tick on the, when they send the message? What's going on? So there's a Gemara that says in Abu Dazara. The Gemara says that Rabbi El Azar ben Durdaya goes and has a conversation with the sun and the moon, with the mountains, the valleys, and they answer him back. Asks Tosafot, what's he talking about? Who, he had a conversation with the mountain? Or was he smoking? The answer is, Tosafot gives two answers. One answer is, that the conversation he has is with um, the malach that is appointed on each one of those things. Because as the Gemara says, en lecha kol esev esev, you don't have a blade of grass in this world that grows without a malach standing over it saying, Grow. Now, if you're imagining a million different angels with cloaks and wings, you know, whipping a blade of grass, that's really weird. But we've already discussed this many times. What is a malach? A malach is Ratzon of Hashem. That means that there's not a blade of grass that grows 
without God's will for it to grow. Single purpose mission. So exactly. And again, it's not and it's not floating with a halo and you know and there's traffic of angels and there's a highway, right? That's not what, what what's happening here. But it, once you think of it that way, it's obvious. Of course, a blade of grass doesn't grow without God wanting it to grow. Okay. Now, once we see that, once we understand that, now we can understand tehom el tehom kore. One tehom says to the other, the angels who are in charge of the deep are saying one to another, we need to give our waters. Why? Because the whole point of the nisuch amayim, of the pouring of the water in the time of Sukkot, is the communication with Hashem to say to God, we need the rain. So the result of kol tzinorecha is that it affects the tehom and the tehom causes the moisture levels of the world uh, uh, to rise. The second opinion uh, over there, the second opinion over there says that what does it mean Rabbi Lazar ben Durdaya uh, communicates with the mountains, with the valleys, with the stars, with the moon. Tosafot says, um, Rabbi Lazar ben Durdaya imagined to himself, if I was to try and ask, if I was to enlist the help of all of these beings, what would they say to me? They would say, why? We're going to pray for you? We have to pray for ourselves. That means that there's a form of expression sometimes that the Gemara is understanding that those beings would have offered. Based on their characteristics. Given, the, given based on their characteristics, based on their needs. So as an example, the Gemara over there says, until we ask for mercy for you, we have to ask for mercy for us. Why would a, a mountain need to ask for mercy? Because mountains crumble. So the mountain, its job in this world is to be the thing that it was set up to be. You have a, a lake. What is the lake praying for mercy for? That its waters should stay full and shouldn't dry up. So Rabbi Elazar ben Duday is saying, if I was to ask them to pray for me, what would they say? Until we pray for you, we have to pray for ourselves. So the first and second answers of Tosafot on that Gemara, Daf Yud Zayin, Abu Dazara, are the answers as well that you could express over here what this conversation is between Tehom el Tehom Kore, the Kotsin Orecha, Komish Berech Vegalech Alai Avaro. Gemara continues. Amar Raba. Raba expl- explained. Lididi Chazuli Hahu Hai Ridaya. Once upon a time, I saw the angel Ridya. Now, to me, I look at this Gemara, and what do I see? That the second opinion of Tosafot seems to be borne out. Because we're rolling off of the conversation of Tehom of Tehom. Comes Rabbi and Rabbi says, oh, well, once I saw an angel talking. Right? According to the second understanding of Tosafot, then that would be a very natural segue to the next line of the Gemara. I saw an angel. I saw a vision. I once saw this angel, Ridya. Dami igla tilta upirsa svate. It looks like a, 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 a small cow, okay? And upirsa, and it, pirsa means it's opened. Sifvate, his lips are opened. Vikaima ben tehoma tata'a, the tehoma ila'a. And it appears between the lower depths, the lower, um, the stratosphere, if you will, uh, um, of the earth, which has a, a gathering of water, and the higher. <coughs> <laughs> okay, so now he addresses this angel that has this form, the form of a, of a baby cow with its lips opened and, and pursed effect, effectively. He says to the waters that are ila'a, right, let down your waters. To the uh, waters, the depths of the below, he says, Aba let the waters gush forward. Shene'emar, like it says, Hanitzanim niruba aretz, right? What is the end of that pasuk? Hanitzanim niruba aretz, the, we saw the blossoms in the ground. Eta zamir, zamir higia, the time of the pruning has come. Or another opinion of zamir is the singing of the bird. Vekolator, and the voice of the Torah is heard in our land. So the Gemara is expressing over there that there's different ways of communicating each part of this Pasuk. Okay? Let's take a look. Rashi exp- explains how we took each part of that Pasuk 
to say what the rabbi was saying. Okay? Hanitzarim Neruba Aretz. You see that Rashi? It's right by the Haggahot Bach on the left side, about seven, six lines down in the narrow lines. Hanitzarim Neruba Aretz, Kilomar. When they pour the water on the holiday, so nitzanim, he's translating nisuchim, like the pourings. When the pourings are seen in the earth, they only come from one year to the next. Like these blossoms that blossom forth once a year. What does Zamir mean? Zemirot Hechag, the singing of the holiday. As at that point, Kol Hator, right? Kol Hator, we translated as the voice of the dove. The Gemara over here is saying, Malach Dome Lishor, because in Aramaic, the word Tor and the word Shor are interchangeable. So the voice of the Shor is heard. Targum Shor Tor, Shibisha'ashim and Aschim Ma'im Achag. Who Omer Kain? That's when the voice of the shore rings out and expresses to each of the water, the, the depths of the water, to rain down uh, their, uh, their, what's it called, their, their waters. So he, the rabbi is expressing that he saw this spiritual vision communicating to, uh, of, this, of this cow that's, that's going to, I guess the lips are open as a sign of it being prepared to drink, okay, or to eat uh, from the results of the water. And he dictates, this angel dictates to the waters to give. Now, na- normally when you translate the word tehom, tehom always means a depth, okay? So there's a lower, wa- a lower depth and a higher depth. So the first way you understand the Gemara is that there's two layers of the water that are beneath the earth. And this, this, Angel sits between these two levels. The second way of understanding this is actually the opposite. That there's a tehom ila'a, and that refers to the heavens. Why would you call that the depths, if it's the heavens? Because depth only means how deep the water runs. And if you remember, we learned earlier in the Gemara, we talked about how there's tremendous deposits of water up in the heavens. And if you remember, I actually bought in the article from the newspaper which talked about the deposit of water that's floating around in space that is the equivalent of 32 bazillion times all the water here on Earth. Remember I showed you that? Yeah. Right? So we literally find a tehome, underwater spring under the Earth and an underwater spring, sorry, a depth of water as well floating around, so to speak, in the skies. And uh, it is from both of those uh, regions that uh, the Nisuch the, HaMayim uh, brings forth the water. By the way, just an interesting thing for those of you who, are, uh, who pay attention to these types of things. What does the angel say to the water? What does he say to the lower water? What does he say? What does he say to the higher water? Chashor Memecha. What does he say to the lower water? Aba Memecha. So, What's really interesting is if you have a machzor for Sukkot, you'll see one of the things we say in the prayers for the rain is we use the word chashrat ma'im. So you, you think to yourself, what is this word chashrat ma'im? What does that have to do with anything? What does that mean? And you need to read the English because you never saw that word chashrat ma'im. And then you see other words. But now we're realizing that that prayer was written with such depth that he's quoting in the prayer for the rain, chashor ma'im. That's where that word comes from. So he's, you're able to ask, using the language of the angel, for the heavenly waters and for the earthly waters. There's so much, so much depth and profundity goes into the, uh, into the uh, creation of our sidur and our tefilot. Okay, let's continue. We're now moving on to the next part. Hayumit anim, miyaduk shamim. What happens if they were fasting and the rains came down, so you're already fasting. Okay, remember, there were certain fasts um, that they started fasting the night before, and certain fasts that they started fasting in the morning. So what happens if they were fasting, but the rain came, uh, all right? Um, <clears throat> Went to bed fasting. 
Yes. And the rain came before they woke up. Correct. Tanur Rabbanan. Hayum They were already fasting. They are do, or it could be that they're fasting from Alot, and from Alot to Nets, it already rains. But they're already in the process of fasting. Okay? Right? Alot comes before Nets. Right? Hayum et Anim. Viyardulahem Kshamim Kodim Netzachama. They were fasting and the rain came down before sunrise. Lo yashlimu. They don't have to complete the fast. La'achar netzachama. What happens if it rained after netzachama? Yashlimu. Divrei Rabbi Meir. That's what Rabbi Meir holds. So it's only if it rains before nets, that even though the day started, but the day didn't really start, okay? At that stage we say, you're able to get rid of the fast, you don't have to complete it. However, Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Rabbi Yehuda says, Kodem chatzot lo yashlimu. Um, so long as it stops, it starts raining before chatzot, so even if it rains after Netzachama, but it rains before midday, halacha should be, lo yashlimu, they do not have to finish it. Le'acha chatzot, but if it starts to rain after chatzot, yashlimu, already half the day is here, you know, you, start, you have to complete the fast. Rabbi Yossi Omer, Rabbi Yossi says, Kodem tet sha'ot lo yashlimu. Um, if it happens before nine hours into the day, okay, then they don't have to, uh, they don't have to continue. But after nine hours into the day, then already they have to, uh, what's it called? Uh, they have to complete the fast. What, what are the differences between the opinions? The question is, at what point do we say, like the day has started? Netzach is the natural start of the day, okay, because it's sunrise. The break of dawn, everyone's still sleeping. Sunrise, already the sun is out, that's when the day begins. The second opinion says, no, uh, you know, we, we're talking about uh, the chatzot, the, mid, the middle of the day. Why the middle of the day? Because the middle of the day, that's a time already where people have eaten, they're eating the major, the, the big meal of the day was lunchtime. So we don't have that. In our culture, we eat our biggest meal is which meal? Yeah. Is dinner. By the way, least the healthy. The it's least healthy the way. Eat the most, eat the breakfast most in the breakfast. And the lightest in dinner. Why? Because to sleep and be inactive on the food is the worst for your body. Okay? Which, by the way, is one of the benefits of intermittent fasting because it forces a person, if they want to eat the next day, to eat their last meal earlier. Okay? Now, so the, the, the second opinion of Yudah says the way we decide this is by the main meal of the day, which is chatzot. The third opinion of Yossi. He says, Kodem Does that change with the, with the era? Like, if you ask that opinion, yeah. and they realize that, that that now big meal changed, would that change his opinion? I don't think so. Can I tell you why? Because yeah. part of Rabbi Yehuda's logic is that I skip breakfast all the time. How do you know if today is a fast day for me? Not when I skip breakfast. No, it's when you get to lunch. When I skip lunch, then you know I'm fasting. If the main meal was dinner, and it's already after nightfall, there would be no way to use the meal to decide whether or not I fasted the day, because it's at the end of the day. It's the identifier. Exactly. It's the identifier when it's in the middle or in the beginning. But it can't be the identifier when it's at the end of the fast. Right. Most people even though, have two meals. Very few people are going to have one meal a day. Exactly. Okay. Um, the last opinion, Rabbi Yossi, says, no, the way we decide whether or not it, uh, it's a fast day is when the day begins, but not when the day begins for an average guy. The last point of when the day begins is when the day began. The latest time of Shacharit. Who's the latest guy to get up in the morning? Who's the latest guy? That's the kings. The kings wake up late. And when they wake up, the, these, uh, these royalty, when they wake up late, so at that time... What uh, nine hours in the day? Day starts at sunrise? Is, is, is it hour one? Uh, yeah, at Alot even. So it's 5 a.m. Is, 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 is our load now? Let's say. Right? Yeah. So nine hours is... It's, it's not nine hours, tech, it's nine halachic hours, right. but let's just say for the sake of yeah, argument, yeah, 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 yeah. we're talking about right. 2, p.m. 2 p.m. So the, the, the royalty, why'd they eat lunch at 2? Because they, bro- no, they ate breakfast at 12. Because uh, they woke up. They at woke up at 11, <laughs> right? So the royalty that was waking up very late, and that's, by the way, how we learned Shema, Right? Well, the, la- latest the, the latest time. time is the time that the, the Bnei Melachim get up. That's the latest opinion. Right. 
the latest opinion for Shema yeah. is when, they, when the, these people rise, okay? So they woke up after everybody. So the earliest time... How do they calculate that? What do you mean? How did they know when the latest time <laughs> yeah. the kings... kings so so it's, what's interesting, in our day, everything is haphazard. But everything is haphazard because we have electricity. So we can control the way the days work. Right. At the time, the only time that you were pro- had productive was with sunlight. So the farmers were up at the crack of dawn to be able to take advantage of every minute of light, okay? The kings that didn't need to do that, so they woke up at a certain point. But the sun, the sun still set for them too. And that's why they're getting rid of daylight savings. Farmers. Yeah. To have more time to, to, have farm. More time to farm. To be late. Yeah. And we don't have to suffer because of that. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what? They suffer so that we could eat. We could suffer so that they could have more time. Very well said. <laughs> okay. My friends, let's, let's just finish this point. Shekin, so what, where do we find that? Where do we find this idea um, that, that, that uh, they, they, they eat at that time and that's how you decide if it's a fast? Shekin matzinu be'achav melech Israel. When it came to Achav, the king of Am Yisrael, shit'ana mitesha sha'ot velemala, that he would fast from nine hours and onward. Hara'ita ki nichna Achav. The pasuk says about him, now look, you see, Achav, Achav was a wicked king. He lived in the time of Eliyahu and Avi. He decided to do Teshuvah. How did he express his Teshuvah? He fasted from nine hours. And what does it say about him? You see, Achav, he's, uh, he's capitulated, he's bowed, he's bent the knee. And you see, therefore, that fasting from that point illustrates um, that, that that is considered a fast. Rabbi Yehuda, Nisi'ah, Gazar Ta'anita, Rabbi Yehuda, one time he made a fast, and the rain came down, he thought, okay, you know what, uh, we're going to finish, we're going to finish the fast, because it ca- came after, Rabbi said, that's, you know, we learned, that the time you decide it by, is by, whether it's before or after Chatzot, what was Rabbi Ami actually saying to him? That the opinion of Netz, which is Rabbi Meir, is not the opinion we follow. It's the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. So why did Rabbi Ami decide to say, to choose the middle opinion? Because the middle opinion was Rabbi Yehuda. So he was telling him that your own opinion um, is, uh, is, is, uh, is Chatzot. Okay? <clears throat> Fine, we'll continue from here, Bezat Hashem, next week. Why wouldn't the rabbi follow his own opinion?